Ready, Emily? I'm ready. Are you ready? This is our cold open. Ready? Oh my gosh. Are you ready? This is it. I'm not ready. Wait no, a minute. Go it's back. It's not a cold open. Start, I need a I need a warm open. You need a warm open? Okay. Yeah. Warm oh, it up for heat uh, it up. Uh-uh. Put it in the microwave for me. And then yeah. is it a warm parsnip open? It's it's <laughs> what? Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. Every week on Butter No Parsnips, your hosts Emily Moyers and Kyle Imperator take you on an adventure through the weird, wacky, wonderful, and sometimes even wicked world of one wayside word. Strange characters, delightful bits, and general joyousness abound. Join them as they test each other's etymological expertise. Hey Emily, how's life treating you today? (laughs) Uh, life is treating me, uh, oh, I was thinking, I was trying to think of a norm joke, but then um, I realized that's a really depressing way to open up a podcast. I, it is. And I meant the cereal, so. Oh, well, I, I know that eaten... affects your tummy when you have it in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I am just a boiling sea of irritable bowels, but that's yeah. beside the point. Yeah. Great imagery. Yeah. Yeah. We love that. That's, that's the tone I want to set for this episode. Well, that's good to know. Uh, Speaking of episodes, hey everybody, this is Butter No Parsnips. I'm Kyle. I'm Emily. And today we're going to talk about a word whose tone, I guess, is set with the boiling sea of (laughs) irritable bowel. That's right. (laughs) But I don't know what this word is. It's a secret to me. It's a secret you're about to learn, Kyle. I'm about to learn it. Emily, tell me about it. Your word in this episode, Kyle, is spaghettification. Oh, no. Yeah. It is. I mean, I'll spell it, but I think you know how to spell it. It's I S- think I. Yeah. Mm-hmm. S p a g h e t t i spaghetti, f i c a t i o n fication spaghettification. And you might be thinking to yourself, "That's not a mystery. I know what that word means." Uh, but there is sort of a general definition, but also a more specific usage. Tell me, give me the origin, the language of origin. I guess English via Italian. <laughs> via Italian. But, but English, That's, That really. is the best definition of me. <laughs> <laughs> English <Yeah>. via Italian. <laughs> That's Kyle. Okay. Spaghettification. Emily, I, I think I know what this word means. Do you? I think I do, but I'm going to ask more questions so that I can get closer to to what All I right. think the definition Well, why is. don't you start? What do you think the the general, you know, non-specific meaning is? I mean, is it just to turn something into spaghetti? I think more more broad. More broadly. To turn turn something into pasta. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something that we Italians do on a daily basis. Yeah. I'll just say the the general definition is to turn something into spaghetti metaphorically. To to sort of stretch something out. Like spaghetti. Oh, I'm going to need more. Give me more. Like, give me an example of how one, like, what's something one might spaghettify in that sense. I mean, in that sense, you could say that, that, you know, dough is spaghettified when it's made like the East Asian way, where they, they're sort of stretching it out and folding it and stretching it like out. taffy. Yeah. You, so you said, so taffy goes through a po- process of spaghettification. Sure, 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 sure. Can you say that about, like, conversations? I don't, I guess you could. I haven't seen it in that context. Hmm. Well, it will be now. Now that I know and can abuse that word. (laughs) That's going to be our goal for this episode, to try and use spaghettification to describe (laughs) To describe anything but than what it is supposed to be described (laughs) as. But there is, there's a very specific use case for spaghettification that is used modernly. I, I, I have to ask, does it have to do with something about black holes? Yes, Kyle. You oh are, my gosh. You are right there. Is that is spaghettification what happens to something when it goes through a black hole? You got it exactly. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm so proud. Years of watching Nova Science Now with my dad have really paid off. Oh, what a special moment this is. Should we get your dad in? Yeah, can we get Neil deGrasse Tyson on? I know we can. <laughs> Don't even lie to me. I know Kyle, we can get him on here. Is Neil deGrasse Tyson your dad? Maybe. Wow, this is news to me, but I'm excited. <laughs> but uh, spaghettification, to to give 
the more exact definition, refers to the effect of extreme gravitational pressure on a body of matter, in particular when exposed to the extreme forces of a black hole. And basically it's the idea that as something gets sucked into a black hole, it gets stretched out like spaghetti. I mean, probably one of the best modern words, I would say. It's a great one, and one that is used like regularly today which is rare for the words that we talk about on this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I guess you hinted at it earlier that the word comes from other than the specific of black hole meaning. It, it, was the word used before science used it for black holes? Yeah, I mean, the word spaghettification, I imagine, has basically existed as long as the word spaghetti has existed, but was used almost never and kind of intended, I guess, to be like ridiculous as just like a silly word to spaghettify. It's a Anything. silly word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean it is a really a silly word, but yeah. lovely. And I'm I'm gonna talk about uh a usage that is not astrophysics related later, but I want to get into the main usage of the word first. The meat and potatoes. The meat and on, potatoes. But I guess we don't need potatoes. It's the meat the and, meat and, and the spaghetti. Pasta. <laughs> yeah, the meat and spaghetti. The meat of and everything. spaghetti of this topic. The bolognese, if you will. The bolognese. It was first used in an astrophysics context in the mid to late 1900s. The kind of seminal example that gets quoted a lot is Stephen Hawking's 1988 book, A Brief History of Time, which was his book about physics and cosmology, but but written for people who didn't know anything about physics and cosmology. Sort of like the layman's guide to astrophysics. I'm sure that was really just like one of those dime store novels. You could read that in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it was it was it was sort of intended to be like for the general public, as a lot sure. of Hawking's work was. He was kind of trying to like bring it out to the masses. And in this one section of the book, Hawking explains what black holes are by telling the story of an imaginary astronaut getting sucked into a collapsing star and yeah, talking about like... imaginary, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, this guy. Yeah. Uh, we could call... We could say his name was Fred. Um, and uh, Fred had a really bad problem saying nasty things about a guy named Steve. <laughs> <laughs> And so he got pushed into, I mean, he fell <laughs> yeah. into a black hole. And lo and behold, we discovered spaghetti. <laughs> and that's the origin of spaghetti. <laughs> Thank you for coming to my talk. <laughs> the Italians did it again. <laughs> but yeah, he's he's talking about this imaginary astronaut and, and what would happen to him and all the different ways that a black hole would kill him. Oh my gosh. And he says, quote, gravity gets weaker the farther you are from the star, so the gravitational force on our intrepid astronaut's feet would always be greater than the force on his head. The difference in forces would stretch our astronaut out like spaghetti or tear him apart before the star had contracted to the critical radius at which the event horizon formed. Which is a mouthful, but basically says because his feet are closer to the collapsing star, it's getting stretched out faster than the bit of him that's farther away. So he gets stretched out like a noodle. So he doesn't use the word spaghettification, but no. he comes up with the idea that someone turns to spaghetti. Well, here's the thing. This book, while it is the most widely quoted, was definitely not the first usage of this spaghetti metaphor. Uh, um. I found examples going back to the mid-70s, and they're all throwing around the word spaghettification like it's an already established term. Oh, and second of all, not only was this book not the first usage of spaghettification, it's not even the first usage of this imaginary astronaut story. Oh. I found a book in 1981 called Mysteries of the Universe by Nigel Henbest, who's the cock of the walk. The cock of the walk. <laughs> and he is describing, quote, an astronaut setting out on a black hole exploration trip. And Henbest says they would first suffer from the intense X radiation generated by the hot gas disk and then from spaghettification, stretching out by the black hole's ever increasing gravitational forces. I, I just want to say I love that he felt he didn't have to describe spaghettification a a any more than just say, oh, stretch, he they get stretched out like like, that's enough to describe a ridiculous word like spaghettification. Well, I'll tell you why he might not have, because I found another book from 1977, even oh, further gosh. back, called The Key to the Universe, A Report on New Physics by another Nigel, Nigel Calder. Wow. 
They're just filling up this field here, huh? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Cambridge was full of Nigels. But this book by Nigel Calder was really interesting because it's like partially about astrophysics, but also partially about the astrophysics community and the different like theories and conversations that have been happening in that community. Oh, that's fun. Um, and he says, quote, and the fate of the imagined space traveler who stumbled upon a black hole became a commonplace way of describing the extraordinary work of gravity in and around a black hole. Before being trapped and crushed, the unwary astronaut would first be stretched into spaghetti. Like he's talking about it like it's already a thing. And it's 11 years before Stephen Hawking's book came out. <laughs> yeah. So what year is that? That's 77. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, but I realized, you know, like all of the books that I found are talking about it like it's already an established term. Mm. And my thinking is that maybe the the theory was kind of first launched in like a lecture and sure. wasn't put into writing until yeah. later. So it could still be the case that Hawking was the first to come up with it and he just didn't write it down. Oh, he sure, just, sure, sure, sure. You know, I don't know. It could have been anybody that like gave been, I a mean, talk at frankly, Cambridge. I did it, Emily. Oh my gosh, Kyle. I'm sorry. That's why I knew from the beginning. Wow. Um, so you came up with it. I mean, this is embarrassing for me to talk about this. Like you've never heard of it. Yeah. I mean, come on. I mean, what do you think I am? I, Some kind of rube? You're no rube. You were a professor at Cambridge in 1977. Oh, I forgot it goes about back that. earlier than that, Emily. Oh, 1962. All right. I had to I had to find some way to talk about my love of pasta in the lecture hall. <laughs> I like this sounds like the start of like a film noir. Yeah. 1962. I had to find some way. I was sitting in my office when I got a knock at the door. It was Ravioli Mulligan. <laughs> <laughs> she came in with her three sets of legs and she said, <laughs> "Doc, tell me about black holes." And that's when I knew it was over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really like to think that that was a good accent of some sort, but I have a feeling it, that... I don't know what it was, but it was <laughs> it was good, Kyle. We're going to put that right up on the fridge. <laughs> it's my, my noir accent. <laughs> <laughs> but what's cool about this idea of spaghettification is that, you know, obviously the a person has never been spaghettified. That's just like a story that we use to talk about black holes. But we have observed multiple events. Wait, of... you're telling me that we've never spaghettified a person? No, the, none of the black holes are close, Kyle. <laughs> Emily, if they were, I we'd be think fucked. We must have, <laughs> in some way. I mean, there's got to be. I I find it hard to believe that this word spaghettified exists, and no one has tried to do it to a human. <laughs> what do you mean, tried to? <laughs> in any way? No, 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 no. I've got no, no. People have been spaghettified, and I wanna, I'm want i going to stick to this. I'm going to stick to my guns. You've seen Willy Wonka, right? <laughs> you, well, did you see the one with Johnny Depp? Yes, I have. You did, all right? So As, we, as did we all. So, so uh, Violet, Baudelaire, not Baudelaire, that's Baudelaire. series of unfortunate events. <laughs> Violet Beauregard. <laughs> she turns into a big old blueberry, and then at the end, she's all stretchy. Because she had to go through the juicer. It's true. It's true. She has been spaghettified. I'm <laughs> I, sticking to my guns here. Okay. We have okay. spaghetti. I mean, I guess I, that was a I'm fictional character. I'm sorry that I've hit such a nerve. I, somebody must have been spaghettified. We're gonna. I'm gonna just leave it at that. Okay. Well, I'll 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 correct. I'll I'll be more specific. Nobody has ever been spaghettified by a black hole. All right. I'm still wary. But here's the thing, Kyle. Here's what's really cool. Mm -hmm. is that other things have been spaghettified and we've seen it. We have observed multiple events of stars and galaxies getting sucked into black holes. It's a super recent thing because we're like just now getting the technology and knowledge to be able to observe these things. But they're called tidal disruption events, mm. which is like a star gets close enough to a black hole to be affected by its tides of gravity. That's why it's tidal. Oh, tidal, tidal. Gotcha. 
Oh, terrifying. What a scary thought. It is. And the star is like when it drifts too close to a black hole, it is either ripped apart or stretched into spaghetti. And like I said, we've observed uh, a handful of these in the past several years, decade or so. But the one that I think is worth talking about is a tidal disruption event that happened to this pair of colliding galaxies called ARP 299, ARP 299. I'm not sure how you pronounce it because it's not it's not like a Initialized. It's like capital A, lowercase RP. Arp. I mean, it's it's got to be ARP then. And I I've, think so. I mean, oh my God, this is the best discussion we've ever had. I get to learn about <laughs> spaghetti and something named ARP. ARP 299. Yeah. <gasps> okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tell me, okay, let's, before we get into the spaghettification of ARP, who lives on ARP? What are their daily lives? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So to give you a geographical context, ARP 299 is approximately 134 million light years away Mm -hmm. in the constellation Ursa Major. Oh, it's in the Big Dipper. That is even better. That means I've looked at ARP all my life. (laughs) You have been, we've been looking at ARP our whole lives. It's been there all along. Watching over us. Are they called Arpians, people who live on ARP? Or I think they have to be. Arpites. Ooh. Ar- Arpoids? Arpoons. Arpoons! <laughs> <laughs> and they've got, they've got spears for hands. For hands. Oh. It's really a sad living. It's like, it's like if everybody was Edward Scissorhands, but <laughs> yes. no one's unique because of it. <laughs> no, it's just life. But life is designed with that hand shape in mind, you know? Yeah, they sure, get by. sure. So ARP-299 is actually a pair of galaxies Mm -hmm. that have been colliding. Both of them have black holes at their center. And over a 10-year period from 2005 to 2015, scientists at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory watched a star drift close to one of the black holes and slowly get spaghettified in one of them. And... Here's the really cool thing, because in most cases, when scientists say that they, quote, observed something happening in deep space, what they actually mean is that they observed like a series of data points that suggests that this happened. Yeah. yeah, But there aren't there aren't like images. But in this case, there are images. You can find this online. You need to send me a picture right now. I will. It's a series of infrared images it's not like a photo so this is a quote from one of the scientists who who published this observation seppo matilla they said as time passed the new object stayed bright at infrared and radio wavelengths but not in visible light and x-rays the most likely explanation is that thick interstellar gas and dust near the galaxy's center absorbed the x-rays and visible light then re-radiated it as infrared so it sort of looks like A heat map, you know, where it's just like colors. Right, of the light. Yeah. That they're uh, they're observing the light changing because it's... Because the star is literally changing shape. Yeah, oh my gosh. And you can you can find these images online. I highly recommend you do because I'm you can at them literally right now. watch this little blurry ball of light expand and stretch out to get longer and thinner like spaghetti. It's crazy. Oh my god. Look at Isn't this. it cool? <laughs> this is wild. That's science happening before your very eyes, Kyle. I don't have a joke for this. I just think it's amazing and terrifying. Just like awe-inspiring in a bad way. Yes. Cuz soon we'll all be spaghettified. That's the way I want to go. That's <laughs> the way my forefathers would want me to go. <laughs> so, now Kyle, yeah. I want to jump back a little bit. Oh, okay. Sure. To long before this was used in a scientific sense. Oh, okay. Yeah. And and we're going to go back to to the earliest appearances of the word spaghettification. Sure. The earliest one that I could find is from a translation of a French play by Alfred Jarry. Okay. Have you have you ever heard this name Alfred Jarry? I uh, don't think I have. Well, what if I told you his most famous work is a play called King Ubu? Oh, no. Have you heard of this? (laughs) I have heard of this. I'm so excited. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Why don't you tell me what you know about King Ubu, and I will fill in the gaps. Oh, my God. I mean, this is like, wow, what a good episode for me. (laughs) Okay, so King Ubu is 
like a, a wackadoo if I could quote myself from another episode. What was it? Gaga doo doo nonsense? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this play is a bunch of gaga doo doo nonsense. And I can't remember the story, but it's this horrifying m- man with a with a spiral on his stomach and and it makes no sense in it, but it has yeah. some kind of ul- ulterior meaning, but the meaning is that it has no meaning, right? Yeah, kind of. It's 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 like meant to be absurdist. So, yeah, uh, King Ubu is the first in a trilogy of plays called the Ubu Plays, oh. written by Alfred Jerry. The first oh, one, wow. King Ubu, was performed in 1896. I'm sorry, wait, wait, wait. These plays were performed? It was performed in 1896? Well, hang on, because it's... <laughs> I mean, your your shock is correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was performed in 1896. It was a loose parody of Macbeth. Ubu's wife convinces him to kill the king and grab power, and then he becomes this horrible dictator. And there's elements from other Shakespeare plays worked into the plot, too. And it was kind of meant to be like a satire of the bourgeoisie and greed and abuse of power. Sure. But, as you said, the play itself was just completely it's bizarre and absurd the scenes in the dialogue are all super surreal it's full of like really inane humor it's littered with obscenity literally the first yes. line of the play is the word shit misspelled yeah of course <laughs> yeah it wouldn't be cool enough if it was spelled correctly yeah which That'd be too i don't on the nose i don't really know how you would deliver the line of shit misspelled <laughs> I, I, you would just pronounce it incorrectly, right? I guess so. <laughs> but it it was performed once at the Theater of Paris, not even as a real production, as just like a run through for industry people. But the backlash was so strong <laughs> from how obscene and absurd it was that a literal riot broke out oh after the performance. And Ubu Roy... <laughs> was banned from that stage and moved to, like, a puppet theater in the slums of town. Oh, my God. Was it done with puppets? I guess so. I could almost see it making more sense with, like, marionettes or, like, those, you know, French puppets. I could almost see it adding up more. For some reason, I'm picturing an image of him... Is there well, an yes, image associated the, with the original play? The script, the original script came with, it was like full of all these drawings that Alfred oh Jerry God. did, like in the margins and stuff. And that was like part of the script. They are monstrous pictures, monstrous descriptions. Oh, yeah, people. absolutely. It's like Doodle Bob, but a man. <laughs> yeah, it's like Doodle Bob, but a man and also creepypasta. Yes. <laughs> It's it's really horrifying. I can understand why this was banned so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> but despite his play being banned, Jerry wrote two other plays to follow King Ubu. There was Ubu Koko, which means Ubu Cuckolded. Oh, good, and of course. Ubu and Shen, which is Ubu in Chains. I don't even want to know what that one's about. <laughs> yeah. Because well, either think... way, it's bad. Yes. <laughs> I think based on the theme here, I'm I'm assuming it's like either Ubu has been arrested or they just mean like the chains of marriage (laughs) sure but these two plays were never performed in his lifetime because unfortunately alfred jerry died at 34 oh no yeah i I don't know yeah i guess that's sad but but clearly he had some stuff going on (laughs) yeah 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 (laughs) wait how did he die was he murdered by one of his uh characters that came to life in this horrifying apparition <laughs> that's right yes <laughs> yeah king ubu came to life with a magic pencil and tried to erase him <laughs> i tried to erase him but this is where the word spaghettification comes in uh in the second play ubu cuckolded yeah good <laughs> there is this scene where uh, evidently ubu has been has been made a cuckold in this play, and Ubu is confronting the man who slept with his wife, Rebontier, and Ubu is essentially threatening to torture Rebontier. It's this whole insane scene. He like pushes Rebontier to the ground, and then he's like, "Oh no, he hit his head. He's probably just gonna die now." But like, all he did was fall, fall over. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's really. I read just a little chunk of the script, and it's absolute nonsense. But then Ubu says, "Quote." 
There's nothing to be done with him. We'll have to make do with twisting the nose and ears, with removal of the tongue and extraction of the teeth, laceration of the posterior, hacking to pieces of the spinal marrow, and the partial or total spaghettification of the brain through the heels. He shall first be impaled, then beheaded, then finally drawn and quartered, after which the gentleman will be free, through our great clemency, to go and get himself hanged where anywhere he chooses. No more harm will come to him, for I wish to treat him well. You know, that that King Ubo, you can say a lot about him, but you can't say he's a bad guy. (laughs) I guess you can. What an, what a, I mean, what an, what, what? You you didn't think that was a nice thing to do of him? (laughs) <laughs> I guess I would prefer to, you know, get hanged where I choose. Before the <laughs> spaghettification through your heels? Spaghettification of the brain through the heels. I, he says the partial or total spaghettification yeah, I mean, of the brain through the heels. Like, we're not sure if we're going to be able to manage it all. <laughs> I just don't even understand how that would work. I, how- I, 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 you know, maybe Ubu himself doesn't know. He's just he's just brainstorming, you know. He's just he's just coming up with it. It's you know, it's like you know his... you you let Noggin. the word vomit come out and then you fine tune yeah. it after that. It's a rough yeah. it's know, a rough draft of torture. It's you know it's possible that he was just making some kind of remarks to the press uh, that he actually wasn't going to do. Does he actually get sp- spaghettified? Does that happen to the character in the show? I think they just sort of move on, like like <laughs> maybe it happens off stage. <laughs> Oh yeah, you know? good, 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 good. We we won't do that for you guys, but just know yeah. that this is happening off stage. Yeah, if you hear screams from off stage, that's what you're hearing. Yes, just so you know, just to paint a paint a picture for you. You know, it's it's always more horrifying in your mind than to see it. Well, listen, I mean, you know, I think if I had to rank him, King Ubu, amongst all of the world leaders that I know, um. I mean, yeah. he'd be pretty high up there, you know. Yeah. Definitely Do you think he could? He could. He could play with the big boys. <laughs> I think he could play with the big boys. Trump. Yeah. Kim Jong Un. King Ubu. They're all three of them are <laughs> right up there. Yeah. They they're um making a buddy cop movie together. <laughs> the three of them, <laughs> all partners. <laughs> All, all uh, marching arm in arm down the streets of New York. <laughs> yeah, they've got like a Laverne and Shirley type yeah. <laughs> intro. <laughs> Shlemiel, Shlemabel, partial spaghettification. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Kyle, that's about what I have for uh, spaghettification. Do you feel like you learned? Emily, I learned I laughed. I know. I, I know. You knew this word from the outset, which kind of defeats, you know, the core game of this podcast. But I, I hope it was fun for you, anyway. I, it was so much fun for me, and I did learn a lot. Of, I mean, I, I learned a lot there, and I liked. I, li- I mean, that's all stuff that I like talking about. So, do more episodes about. Just can we talk about? Let, let's just do a second spaghettification episode, so we can talk <laughs> about all this again. <laughs> Well, uh, just to hold you over, Kyle, I do have one more little game for us to play. <gasps> a game? A game. So as I was researching this idea of spaghettification, it occurred to me that there are actually a lot of metaphorical uses of the word spaghetti in our language. So for our mini game today, I thought we'd just see how many of these spaghetti metaphors you are familiar with. I and, love this. And talk about them a little bit. Lay them on me. So first one, spaghetti western. Uh, well, spaghetti western is clearly a western omelet that's broken up <laughs> into a pasta dish. <laughs> into a pasta dish. Spaghetti western. Um, yeah, no, you got sp- it, Kyle. Spaghetti western. That's uh, you know, uh, Italian western film. Yeah, uh, a subgenre of Wild West films made in Europe, typically produced and directed by Italians, but also. Spain and other nearby countries. Mm -hmm. The term was coined by a Spanish journalist, Alfonso Sanchez, in the mid-1960s in the wake of Sergio Leone's films and their huge box office success. So that's, I mean, that's that's a great recent term for spaghetti. Yeah. Another one, spaghetti strap. Spaghetti strap is um, a torture device used in the pasta kingdom. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, but what is it? What is a spaghetti strap, Kyle? A spaghetti strap, you know, it's a thin little strap on a shirt. 
Yeah, thin, yeah. thin little shoulder strap used to support clothing. Mm-hmm. Um, it first appeared in the 1920s with flapper dresses. Uh, and according oh. according to Merriam-Webster, the, the term spaghetti strap was first used in 1972. Oh, wow. It's interesting it took so long for that to catch on. Yeah, they, they were just looking at this very thin piece of fabric and thinking, what the hell could we call this thing? It's, it'll take only a, it, a future modern era to to name yeah, this. I mean, we could never think of something that this looks like. <laughs> Maybe they just didn't eat a lot of spaghetti back in the 20s. Yeah. What about a spaghetti junction? We're getting we're getting a little more niche now. Oh, Do you know what a spaghetti junction is, Kyle? Spaghetti junction. So a spaghetti junction, I'm going to guess that's where there's a fork with a meatball in the road. No, that's <laughs> the Muppets. <laughs> no, a, a spaghetti junction is like a nickname for a very complicated highway interchange. Oh, that's like fun. where a, a million different highways meet. I love that. Yeah, uh, it was coined by journalists Roy Smith and Alan Eaglesfield in 1965, referring to the Gravelly Hill interchange in the UK. And there's also a highway interchange in Las Vegas, commonly referred to as the Spaghetti Bowl. That's great. That's I mean, that is a great use of spaghetti there. It is a great use of spaghetti. Unlike my stint on Chopped, <laughs> where I was told specifically that is not a great use of spaghetti. Were you chopped after that? Um, actually, no. Oh, was there another guy that like didn't use all the ingredients in the basket? Yeah, he just missed. Uh, actually, he put onion in the dish and the judge hated onion so (laughs) wow that is a really good joke for people who know a lot about chopped chopped yeah i know right (laughs) that's a great Uh, that's we're hitting home with the chopped crowd right we're trying i'm trying to cater to my audience (laughs) yeah that's great yeah all right well while we're on uh the chopped train mm -hmm. the next one i have here is spaghetti ice oh is spaghetti that... ice spelled like spaghetti with e i s on the end. Oh, I I wouldn't even know where to begin. Is that German? It is German, and it is German, but meant to sound like ice, like the English word. Oh, is it like some sort of pasta dessert? It is. Yeah. Oh, it is a German ice cream dish made to look like spaghetti. Oh, I think I've seen that in like you know viral sponsored videos sure or like the the back of the menu at the weird diner <laughs> yes yeah it's like oh, i don't um, think i want that yeah it was invented by darlo fontanella who was an italian ice cream maker living in germany in the late 1960s um the spaghetti quote unquote is vanilla ice cream pushed through a modified spetzel press the spetzel. Uh, quote unquote tomato sauce is strawberry sauce and then the quote unquote Parmesan cheese is either coconut flakes, grated almonds, or white chocolate shavings. Oh, so it literally, I thought maybe it was just like stringy. It is literally looks like a bowl of spaghetti. Yeah, it's cream. made to look, yeah, which I imagine is confusing at first, but delicious based on this description. <laughs> Gotta be, yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. And last but not least, I feel I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Yeah, I mean, you absolutely would be remiss there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now we're getting into religion, so I don't want to be wrong here. <laughs> is that what Pastafarianism is? It is. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the, you got it. Uh, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, a.k.a. Pastafarianism, is a satirical religion originally created in opposition to teaching religious beliefs in schools. I mean, do they have values? Did people like go on to that? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, it sort of took on a life as like an internet meme. But it is, you know, it's like a big. There's like a book. There's like a sort of Bible for the Church of the Flying Spaghetti fun. Monster. Fun, fun, fun. It is very fun. But it was like originally created in an open letter written by Bobby Henderson to the Kansas Board of Education, protesting them allowing intelligent design to be taught alongside evolution in public schools. Mm-hmm. And he basically said, well, if you're teaching those religious beliefs, you also have to teach my religious beliefs. And I believe that the world was created by a flying spaghetti monster. I mean, I am on board with him, both in the sense of sticking it to the man and in the sense of I also believe that a flying spaghetti monster is <laughs> is our savior. Savior? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I just a quick question: Does the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is their version of hell one where somebody is continuously spaghettified for all eternity? It must be. Yeah, I, mu- I mean, it's, way to it way be. to bring us back around, Kyle. Yeah, you know. And uh, on that bringing back around, that concludes this episode of Butter No Parsnips, everybody. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for listening. I've been Emily. I've been hungry, frankly. And Kyle. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Yeah. See ya. Thank you for listening to Butter No Parsnips. Butter No Parsnips is produced by Seth Glicksman, Emily Moyers, and Kyle Imperator. The theme music and additional music is by Kyle Imperator. If you liked listening to this episode, subscribe and give us a good rating and or positive review wherever you heard it. If you really liked listening, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash butternoparsnips. There you can get bonus content you can't get anywhere else, like the monthly Patreon-exclusive podcast Buttered Parsnips. Your support means the world to us and encourages us to keep making more. Thanks in advance, and we'll be back next week.